Hi everyone, I'm Ski Oakenfall broadcasting live from Point Blank Music School in East London. Welcome to this artist hangout in the Academy of Electronic Music, brought to you by Google, Armada Music, DJ Mag and Point Blank. It's week three of this exclusive hangout series and today we are happy to welcome Max Graham to join you and the seven winners. DJing since the mid 90s and producing from early 2000, Max Graham is a true dance music legend. While his DJ sets have their roots in trance, He's not afraid of mixing genres and styles, delivering a truly unique set every time. As a producer, he's had chart success in the UK and around the world and has remixed huge artists like Tiesto, Armin van Buren and Gabrielle and Dresden. With 15 years of experience in the industry, Max will be talking to us about his past productions, how he approaches the studio workflow, his work ethic, tips and methods and also how he builds his radio show in Ableton Live. If you're watching live and want to ask Max a question, please post it in the comments section. So, hi Max, are you with us? I am. Fantastic, how are you doing, man? Excellent. Brilliant. Um, it's great to have you here, and I uh, just want to say hi to uh, everyone else as well, the winners, how are you all doing? Yeah, not too bad, you all right? Uh, all right. Great. Hi. Fantastic, well, I, I thought um, it might be a good idea just to kick off the session by listening to a couple of your productions. Uh, you sent me a couple of tracks the other day, uh, do you just want to sort of introduce those and talk about those, Max? Yeah, it's um, nothing you guys aren't familiar with. It's Where You Are and uh, The Evil ID, which were two, two of my original releases from this year. Okay. Um, th these are just the radio edits to get to the point, so uh, go ahead. Cool. Okay, well, I'll, I'll play a sort of section of each one and because uh, uh, we have a sort of time limit here. So um, I'm just going to shoot over to Logic here. And this is the first one. This is the, uh, the Where Are You track. Here we go. <laughs> Sounds great. Love the vocal on that. It actually, it all started with the vocal, which is pretty much my favorite way to produce, to sort of get a vocal that then inspires the chords around it. So the whole track came from that. Oh, really? Vocal. Okay, yeah. so, what, so yeah, that's really interesting because, uh, I mean, I kind of uh, employ that technique of, of getting an a cappella and maybe working around it. But when it actually comes to working with a vocalist, I normally have the music prepared first and I send it to them and then they kind of write some, uh, some, some vocals over the top of that. But for you, it worked I, in a different way, yeah? I've done it both ways and I find whenever I try to write around a sort of imaginary vocal, it doesn't, doesn't come out as well when the vocalist is sort of trying to force over the top of existing chords. And we hear that all the time with instrumentals that become hits and then the label is sort of like, we'll go back and put a vocal on it to sort of make it radio friendly. Yeah. Um, I come from more of a remixer. I did a lot of remixes before I, you know, started working with my own vocals. So it was much more natural for me to take a vocal that was there and then write chords and, you know, start with sort of strings and piano. Yeah, yeah. That, bo that bounce off the vocal and really pull it out, you know, and pull it in different directions. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for me, um, Alana had actually already done that vocal for something else that didn't work out. And it was actually a full song and I ended up just using that, that main chorus loop and sort of just wrote some really basic chords around it. Yeah. Um, which I actually talk about in the Gabriel and Dresden tutorial of Protoculture and I, just with basic piano. And then sort of built the whole track from there. And for me, that's the most comfortable way to work. Yeah, fantastic. Obviously, it's, it's, it's easy to say that. It's not easy for everyone to just get amazing vocals every day and build around them. <laughs> 
Um, for me, I find that direction much easier than writing a blank track and then giving it to a vocalist and hoping she can write something that fits those chords. Yeah, well, no, I, I totally know what you're saying. And, and that's actually sort of one of the techniques that I incorporate into the EMC course is actually kind of taking a cappellas to inspire you to come up with backing tracks and then uh, maybe this sort of stripping away that a cappella and then maybe coming up with a new vocal or working with a, with a vocalist. You know, I think it's a great way to get inspired. I've done that too. I've had vocalists work on existing tracks that, let's say I'm making a, a, you know, a vocal for this, a, a almost finished track with this vocalist. I'll take the vocal off, give it to another vocalist and hear her interpretation or his, yeah. and then write a completely new track underneath it. But at least she got the inspiration from something that was already written with vocals in mind. Yeah, totally. I think so it's kind of a mix and match, you know. I think it can be the hardest thing really is, is finding that initial seed of an idea when you're composing a track, you know, it's, oh, yeah. uh, once you've kind of got, got that, then it can kind of flow and, you know, you can get, you know, you can kind of go ahead with it, but definitely cool. Should we listen to the next track? Sure. Okay. Okay. Here we you go. guys all know this one, I think. Here we go. nodding to this one <laughs> yeah this is it, it's strange because you you sort of make some records mentally thinking you know are are the DJs other cup two gonna play this are the big radio shows gonna like this is this song gonna do well on beat for it yeah and then some songs you make where you're just like I don't care if nobody likes this I'm making this for me yeah and those are always the ones that actually do better that that song took you know a day and a half and yeah I was actually I was spent most of that track learning how to separate the bass so that when you push all the top end out to the to the sides uh, and sort of cut the bass line in the middle where you leave the low end of the bass mono in the middle and then you take the top end of the bass split it to the sides and then offset it slightly so it gives a really big stereo sound cool and i spent most of the track sort of using the track building the track to learn this technique yeah you know, I'm, I'm not the greatest engineer or mix down guy so I'm always trying to learn new tricks mm. and then all of a sudden I kind of realized that I had a track going and I sort of just played this dark you know riff and it's it's a pretty straightforward scale down and then all of a sudden I realized this is probably too dark and weird for a lot of people to play but I love it so I'm going to go ahead with it yeah and it ended up being you know my biggest record of the year for sure fantastic you've hit on a really interesting point as well um about sometimes it's the it's the ideas that you start where you're not actually sort of sitting down trying to write something. It just kind of happens. Something happens. I remember I wrote a track once. I was I was playing in a in a band. I was just finding some kind of pad sounds for this yeah. live set I was doing, and then suddenly I just kind of came across this chord sequence, and then that developed into a track. I was you know I had no plans to actually kind of sit down and write something. Exactly. That's the beauty of electronic music, and I think everyone who writes it will agree. You sort of it's a, so much trial and error until your ears pick up on something that you like. Yeah, yeah. It could be flipping through patches in a synth or, or trying out different riffs or ideas or just grabbing samples from different places and layering them and reversing them and yeah, putting yeah, weird yeah. effects on them. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, this kind of works as something that's hooky and then building the whole song around it. Cool. Well, um, I know that the guys have got, uh, got some questions for you. So um, it'd be great if we can kind of kick off with some of the questions. I know that... Um, Carolis has uh, said he's got to actually kind of head out a bit, a bit soon. So should we start off with you, Carolis, uh, and your question? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, hey, man, how are you doing? You're good. Go ahead. Um, uh, could you tell us your way of starting a new project when you, when you start a new project in a studio? Everyone's very different. Some guys start, I'll, I'll try and keep the, I'm a bit of a talker, but I'll try and keep them brief. Everyone's very different. Some people start with, with breakdowns and the riff and work mm -hmm. back. I actually like to start with the drums and the bass and little samples and then sort of seeing where the energy of the track goes and 
once you start layering enough, you'll sort of start hearing riffs pop out or, or you know, just trying little string or piano ideas on top of it. But for me, it always starts out first with the drums and a bass line to get a really driving groove going and then sort of seeing where the track will go from there. Cool, yeah. Um, I have another one here. Uh, what is your favorite part when you're making a new track? Is it the whole process or there are cer certain areas that you don't like? Well, I, I, know I just talked about that whole beginning part and that's actually the hard part for me because I'm not a great engineer. I always have trouble sort of balancing the kick and the bass and, and I usually have help when it comes to the mix down. So sometimes I get a little frustrated in that point if the track doesn't quite sound driving enough to sort of inspire me to, to finish it. But definitely the best moment is when you nail that riff in the middle yeah. that you know is going to create some emotion on the dance floor. For me, like, you know, you sort of jump out of your chair and, and <laughs> dance around the room and I think every, every producer's done that. You know, to sort of when you get hit that moment where you know you're, you've hit that combination of chords or sounds that are going to sort of light up a room. You know, and sometimes you listen the next day and you realize, eh, it wasn't so good. But in that moment, that's definitely the rest of it is is easy. Building the intro and the breakdown and all the effects and all that is easy. But it's that moment. If you can achieve that moment, that's definitely the best best part for me for sure. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. Well, uh, should we move over to uh, to Yori now? Hey, Max. Very nice to meet you. Okay. Hi. Hey, I have uh, I have the question. Um, how did you get the idea for, for remixing uh, Owner of a Lonely Heart? Where did you get the inspiration for it? Well, I was a fan of that from when I was younger. And that was a period, I think it was 2003, 2004, when I first started working on it, when there was a lot of those remixes. I think Nick Fanchuli had, like, Tears for Fears, and, you know, Deep Dish had... had uh, the Fleetwood Mac stuff, and it was kind of an era for 80s remakes to be done. I remember Steve Potter, Steve Porter played a Miami Vice uh, remake of the theme on uh, during Miami Winter Music Conference, and so I was sort of like, hey, no one's touched this, and it's one of my favorites from from you know way back. That's and the BPM fit, so I chopped it up, put it back together, and that sort of Eric Prid's call on me kind of bass line that that you know, everyone was using at the time really fit, that sort of sub bass. Um, I used it in a couple of other tracks too, but so that, you know, well, Call On Me was another one that was a total 80s remake. So for me, it just was the timing and the inspiration for, of, of loving it when I was younger and it just came together. And again, that was another one that was kind of a joke. It was, I didn't really expect it to do well, but Ministry of Sound called and uh, the rest is history. Yeah, it was a huge hit and I really awesome. enjoyed listening to it even at this day, I, I mean, it's a great track. People, people still mention it to me all the time. The video yeah. is like, the video is hilarious. Yes, it's great. I just watched it uh, before the hangout. And I think I don't know if it was you, but someone else asked. Uh, actually, no, I got a, an interview the other day where someone said, "Who's the girl in the video with the pink outfit?" And like, I have no. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't involved. Actually, involved in the video. I saw a bunch of ideas and proved it. I wish and we like, could show the video yeah. now, but uh, <laughs> we're a bit pushed for time. But it's still, it's cool. still, people still mention it all the time. Brilliant! Yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, we're going to head over to uh, to Adrian now, and Vlad, Adoriani guys. How are you doing? Yeah. Hey Max. Hey hey. Nice to meet you. Could you tell me uh, what should an EDM producer do to get noticed in uh, Canada and the US? I actually, and I saw a couple of other people mention the same question with regard to their country. And I think, I don't think it matters anymore where you are. I think it's so global. And obviously with the internet and, you know, I listen to probably a hundred demos a week. I listen to everything that comes into my demo email and they're from all over the world. And if you look at, you know, who's been successful, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. You've got, you know, Coma from Colombia and then you've got you know, guys from Russia, it just, if your production is there, my single goal as a label owner is to find new unsigned music and artists. People always ask me, do you listen to, you actually listen to your demos? I'm like, that's probably my number one priority over anything is to not let someone else discover an amazing new artist before I do, you know? And so that's my priority is to find, and it doesn't matter where you live and, and you know, as long as you have an internet connection and you can email me a, a, an MP3, you know, you look at how many young successful guys have made it and they've made it, you know, with 
PCs that aren't that powerful with, you know, software that's not that great, and they've just managed to make good music. You know, Artie is a good example. Who, you know, once it blows up, it doesn't matter where you live, you're going to be flying all over the world. And I know it, I make it sound like it's easy, but you know, the music speaks for itself, and location has nothing to do with it. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Uh, is there a difference between the music mixed on stage in Canada, U.S., and Europe? There's a little bit of a difference. I admit, you know, when I go to Argentina, I play more techno because they can really handle, like, they like it sort of deeper and darker. And then, you know, when I'm at a festival for an hour and a half set, which isn't my favorite versus a long set, obviously you play more sort of, you know, friendly, big records that fit in a sort of shorter period of time. So. I play very differently depending on you know how long the set is or you know I think it's a double-edged sword because you don't want to play too differently because you want to sell yourself as a certain type of DJ. I'm almost too diverse for my own good because sometimes you can hear me in two different places and be like it wasn't the same whereas some guys you hear they play exactly the same everywhere they go. So I, I think it really depends case by case on sort of your set time like if I'm playing an opening set. I'm definitely not going to play bangers, even if that's my only visit to that city. And people want to hear me play "Evil Idea" where you are. I just can't do it at 10:30 at night, you know, when I'm opening for someone else or or playing on a tour where there's four or five DJs. And that's just the way I'm built as a DJ. So I really approach each gig case by case. But I think the music now is so universal that the same records really work all over the world, pretty much. If you hit the same sort of crowd, there's, there aren't records that work only in the U.S. or that I find in my scene, anyway. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Adrian, I know you've got more questions, but I'm afraid we're going to have to move on. Uh, Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. cool. It's, it's yeah. great. I, I, I'm going to head over to uh, Aaron now. How are you doing? Uh, we can't can hear you, you Aaron. I think... Uh, can you... Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Okay. Hey, Max. How are you? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I have lots of questions. Uh, okay, let's see. <laughs> Um, well, in a place where mainstream music is like, you know, a culture, uh, is it a good idea to keep fighting for your own sound or should we go uh, into it uh, little by little, you know? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, there's there's different schools of thought. I, I believe in, in really going for your own sound, but it, it sometimes can help, you know, people imitate to begin with and then innovate later on. And I think mm -hmm. if you if you make a couple of hits or a couple of really strong records that fit into a certain scene and get yourself some success and some profile, then you can sort of innovate unless, you know, you have a huge record that is completely different to everyone else's and you can sort of create your own genre almost or create your own movement, mm -hmm. which we've seen people do. But yeah, that's, it's, that's really a, a, a personal decision. I mean, if you, you know, it's... That's a tough one. A lot of guys will say, okay, mm -hmm. I want to make records that will definitely go into the Beatport top 50 or top, mm -hmm. top 20. And then after I've done that for a little while and gained some profile, then I'll sort of, I can innovate a little more and have a little more leeway without losing my profile. Whereas if you're only making sort of weird off the beaten path stuff, you may never gain any profile at all. But then again, you could just, you know, stumble onto something and just explode. So it's a tough one. I think you have to just be original and follow your heart in the studio. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, can I ask another question? Go on in. Make it quick. Make it quick, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How, how do you manage uh, pressure when producing a track? If you have a deadline, for example? Deadlines can actually be your friend. I find sometimes I'll, I'll go around in circles if I don't have a deadline. And sometimes when you have a deadline, you just, you know, turn off the world and really focus. And, and you know, it's that if you crush coal, you get a diamond. Sometimes the harder the pressure is. The better we, something we had Est we had Estro um, here the, a couple of days ago, and she was saying exactly the same thing. You know, it's mm -hmm. there's there's always something else to do, isn't there? There's always emails to reply to or mixes always. to go through. You know, and it's like having a deadline just makes you drop everything and focus on on what you need to do. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Max. Thank You're you so welcome. much. Fantastic. Thanks to, thanks to everyone, by the way. Who's next? Uh, Jonathan. Hey Matt, um, I have one really personal question. I hope you can answer it. Okay, uh, in Venezuela, the electronic scene is starting. So the DJs, the DJs are the one who get notoriety in the scene. In my case, what would be better, DJing or leave the established and being a, a producer? 
I don't know why you have to choose, really. I think, you know, I was a DJ for, for eight years before I started producing. I think being a DJ first definitely helps you producing as far as arrangement and understanding what works on the dance floor. So I think, you know, don't give up the DJ and definitely just use the producing, producing to enhance that. Um, and as we know, you know, it's, it's, it is hard to make an income being only a producer. You do need to perform. So I would say stick with the DJ, definitely. And just produce on the side as much as you can. Oh, thanks. Jonathan, do you have another question? Uh, well, I, I had another question, but uh, so, uh, I don't know, remember who asked something really like and he answered it. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. cool. Well, uh, <laughs> in that case, uh, we're headed over to Ryan. How you doing, yeah. Ryan? How are we doing? You all right? Hey, Max. Hey. hey how are you doing? Um, obviously, I've got, not got a lot of time and so many questions I want to ask. Well, you, you, but, yeah, um, you can ask a couple of questions. It's cool, Ryan. Okay. Um, what's the uh, craziest or funniest thing that you've happened to you when you've been DJing around the world? Um, I had someone throw up on, on one of the turntables. He was, <laughs> he was leaning over the booth for so, I mean, it was, I like to play clubs where the crowd's right on top of you. And, yeah. and this, this girl was sort of had her, you know, head on the glass for so long and her kind of eyes were closed. And, and I really thought she was just into the music and all of a sudden she's kind of, <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was an experience. That was God, 10, 11 years ago. But of course. Did, I you, did you carry on like a professional though? Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I was dying. That. <laughs> the other, the other funny one you'll love is a guy uh, hands me a piece of paper and a pen, and uh, I signed it and smiled and gave it back to him. And he said, "No, no, no, I, I want the name of the song." <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just felt this big. <laughs> so there, yeah, I'm admitting to you the some of the most embarrassing moments of my career. So, yeah. That's wicked. That's wicked. Um, okay, next one. Obviously, it might be a little bit forward, but. Um, as an Academy winner, and I'm going to be um, obviously releasing my track on Armada and next year probably concentrating on establishing myself in the music industry, um, would you give me the opportunity to remix one of your future, uh, future tracks? I would give anyone the opportunity, but only based on that they were had already produced something that really sort of moved me personally. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm really picky. Obviously, Rebrand is a, is a small label, and, and we have, you know, so much amazing talent out there yeah. that it would if if you had produced a couple of things and I'd be happy to you know mm -hmm. definitely send them to me um, produce something that made me go wow then like my pleasure I would love it. Wicked. That's all right, Sandy Snow. Fantastic. That's um, shall we uh, head over to Ramon? How are you yeah. doing, Ramon? Hi. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Um, nice to meet you, Max. Hey, hey. <laughs> um, my question. Um, what is the reason uh, that you produce trance music or uh, not uh, minimal house? What do you love in trance? Melody. <laughs> yeah, okay. For me, I mean, I, I took piano lessons as a kid, and it, it was always for me, you know, I listened to a lot of movie soundtracks, and, and trance was the closest to, um, out of dance music, it was the closest that got the emotion that a movie soundtrack would get. If you ever watch a movie clip without the sound, it's very different than that little 15 second piece of music, you know, that, that makes you, you know, that scene at the end when, you know, he's falling and she's trying to catch him. And, you know, the music makes all the difference in pulling the emotion out of you. And that for me, I only found in trance and, and back in the day progressive, like what Sasha and Digweed and those guys used to play. And so that was always for me the priority was no matter what the, the sort of drums were or, or the percussion or whatever, it had to have a melody that created some emotion. And, you know, I've found techno that has that kind of emotion and, you know, with a big pad or, or strings in it. But you'll find that's always a, a common in my music, whether I'm making, you know, really hard stuff or softer stuff with a vocalist. There's always that melody and that emotion. And, you know, I, I play a lot of different styles. I play techno that doesn't have a melody and I play tech house and, but for me, when I'm making it, it has to have that. That's just what gets me going okay. more than anything else. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, um, what do you think is the best trick uh, against uh, fright? Against what? Yeah. <laughs> fright. Stage fright. Right. Oh, yeah. stage fright. Yeah. Me, uh -huh. as, a, as a DJ for the first, you know, the first time you're, you're going to a gig, yeah. prepare take out as many variables as possible, you know, prepare as much as possible, like 
you know, I'm not, I, I don't like to plan ahead anything, but I think for your first couple of gigs, plan as much as you can because things are going to happen that are going to, you know, throw your concentration off. And if you're already nervous, um, <laughs> if, if you leave everything to, to chance, then things are going to go wrong. So sort of you make sure you know your decks, you know your mixer, you know your tracks, you know your, you know, your USB, you have everything organized. If you're searching for stuff and you can't find stuff and you're nervous, the whole thing's going <laughs> to fall apart. So, I mean, and the only way to get past it all is just keep doing it, you know, keep, mm -hmm. keep uh, getting up there and, and it'll, the nervousness will wear off pretty quickly. Okay. Big thanks, Mike. Uh, Max. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you so much for answering those questions. Um, I just thought we got, you know, got a couple of minutes left. I just thought, you know, is there any, any kind of uh, tips you could give to the guys in sort of in general or, you know, I know uh, you, you're going to talk about your radio show and putting it together in Ableton Live, you know, how important that is for you as a producer and a DJ to, does that kind of focus you? Um, yeah, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, are there any sort of other tips you have? I think one thing that, that I've, I go through, I, I'm definitely more DJ than producer, so I'm good at, or I, I'm, I feel comfortable at making and arranging, you know, melodies and putting the song together, but I'm never comfortable when it comes to the mix down. So I think it's not, there's nothing wrong with sort of either, you know, hooking up with a partner or going to someone else, you know, Protoculture and I've worked together where I sort of work a track to about 75, 80%. And then I send it to him and he'll sort of like delete the kick and come up with a better one. And, change the bass sound to make it balance more. It's just certain things that I've realized my ears and my skill is not good at even after all these years. Um, you know, compression and, and reverb is really, really hard to learn, I think, to really get good at. I mean, the guys that are good at it have been doing it forever. And there's nothing wrong with going to other people and sort of, you know, realizing where your strengths are and combining those strengths. And I think working with someone else is also great have a second set of ears because you can get really snow blind if you if you hear the same sounds over and over for three days not really be able to discern what's good and what's bad and, I, know, I, I love that point you know i think that more and more now you know there's this um pressure for you to be a jack of all trades you know yeah. because you can do everything you know it, it is possible but yeah you know there are producers engineers who have trained for years in this in those skills that you're talking about you know yeah and, and uh, they can really have something to offer you know you shouldn't feel like you have to do it all yeah and i think you know it's one thing taking credit for someone else's work you know that i i don't it, that's not my thing but you know in the rock industry you know madonna will audition 100 songs and then pick 10 and re-record them and release them as her album you know and that's just how it's done yeah but for me i like to if I stand up there and put my hands in the air to work to a melody, I, I want to know that I wrote it. But yeah. then again, you have someone like Mark Sherry, who is an amazing mastering guy. So to do something to the final product and then send it to him to have it make it sound, to give it that shine. You know, it's like an architect designs a house and then the builder builds it. You know, it's like it, it, there's just everyone has their own skill. Yeah, and yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, you know what, I'm really good at up to this point but I'm going to have some help here. Yeah. You know, but that's just something I think everyone gets stuck on. They have to do everything themselves. Yeah. And you know, it, it just, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. Well, you know, it's like at point blank here, we have a whole range of courses, you know, we have a mastering course and a mixing dance music course, you know, and also a sound design course, you know, there's lots of different types of courses, which really do focus on those specific areas. So, um, yeah. well, Pro I mean, protoculture went to school for that and that's why he's one of those guys that can do it from, the start to the finish yeah. and has a very specific, very warm, very good sound yeah, yeah. that I've, I don't think I've ever been able to achieve, you know, in, in writing music. But I know I can write songs that, you know, will rock a dance floor because they have during my sets. And I think, you know, over the years I've had enough records do well to, to justify that. But I don't ever think they sound that great. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I'm totally. always like, oh. I wish the bass was a little bit more balanced and it's just, you know, I don't think it's always easy for everyone. I struggle all the time in the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't be DJing as well and it's just really hard to balance all that. <laughs> but I think if you're original with your production and your music and the music you want to make and, and you know, uh, the other thing someone else mentioned in one of the questions, just as a last point, you know, when you listen to demos, I get a lot of demos and people say, it's not mastered yet. And I said, listen, if you heard your favorite song on AM radio, you would still know it was a great song. Yeah. You know, it can be mono on, on AM or in a 
car passing by, you would still go, that's a great track. Yeah. So when we listen to demos, they can be, you know, they don't have to be mastered. They don't have to sound incredible. Yeah. You know by the music whether this is going to be, has potential as a, as a record that we would want on rebrand or that Armada would want or that we think is going to do really well out there. Yeah. And if, yeah. if the music is there, we can easily together go back and say, okay, we need to pump up the kick or we need to master it this way or that. Yeah. But I know some labels say they want it mastered when they send to them. But for me, you know, the, the proof is you, you could hear a song over the phone and still go, wow, that's a great track. Yeah, totally. It doesn't have to sound super pro when you send it as a demo. If we think it has potential, we can together go back and, and make it something that sounds, you know, rocking. Brilliant. Well, I'm afraid uh, that's all we've got time for. Um, thanks so well, we much. Do this. We can easily do this for another hour. I know, we? I know. Well, we should we should do it again. You know, <laughs> come back and we'll, we'll we'll have another one. But thanks. I'd love to. And to all the guys who didn't get to answer questions, you know, I'm on Twitter and Facebook. Brilliant. And I do use Twitter every once in a while. Yeah. So feel free to ask me questions there or hit me up on my Facebook page. Um, Great. And yeah, we can continue. Thanks so much, so, so much, Max, for your time here at the Academy of Electronic Music, and we'll see you again very soon. And uh, yeah, good luck with all your projects. Well, thanks everyone for hanging out, and thanks to you guys for having me, definitely. And yeah, let's do it again. Brilliant. So, um, thank you, Max. Tomorrow thank we'll be back guys. at 3 p.m. UK time with another electronic music composition session, where I'll be conducting a live vocal session with singer Viv May, actually recording vocals here in the studio and showing you at home and the seven winners how to get the best out of a vocal session. It's not been done before live at AEM, so make sure you don't miss it. Remember, if you like what you see here in the Academy and want to know more about how to finish your own productions and get through that block when you need more inspiration to complete your track and arrangement, head on over to www.pointblankonline.net forward slash electronic dash music dash composition dot php and get enrolled on the full course. AM, AM Academy viewers are entitled to 10% off by using this discount code. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. Uh, and yeah, that's it for today. See you tomorrow uh, for the vocal session at 3 p.m. UK, UK time. And uh, yeah, if I can, I'd just like to uh, bring up that YouTube video uh, that we were talking about earlier. I'm just going to uh, head on over to YouTube and uh, let's just check it out. Here we go. Hope I'm typing this right. There we go. High quality version. Oh dear, I was going to skip the advert. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And uh, unmute it as well. There we go. <laughs> We're all enjoying it. Well, we all know what it sounds like, though. Yeah. It's the kids. I don't know if we came up with that idea, but the kids sold it. I hope I made sense in everything that I said. I know. Everyone has different views on how things are going to be At the end of the day, I'll just you know, be original, have fun. But I like what someone asks. Sometimes it's okay to copy and to develop a skill until you really get to a point. And then you can you know, people, movie makers, you know, anyone, they sort of try to imitate their favorite. And once they get the skill, they'll move